Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Out YouTube channel, and in the video today, we're looking at the timely death of Kodak founder George Eastman. It was March the 14th, 1932, when George Eastman, famed inventor, philanthropist, and founder of Eastman Kodak, invited a few loyal friends over to witness the rewriting of his will. He had made the decision to give a good portion of his money and prized possessions, including his enormous mansion, to the city he called home for his whole life, Rochester. To this end, he bequeathed his house and a $2 million endowment, about $34 million today, to the University of Rochester. Eastman also donated a large sum of money to dental dispensaries across the city, attempting to ensure that no child in Rochester would go without proper dental work. Finally, he left about $200,000, about $3.4 million today, to his beloved niece, Ellen. Cheerfully signing the will, he assured his friends this was just a matter of ensuring his wishes. Later, it was thought that he also wanted his friends to see him mentally alert, so the credibility of his will wouldn't be questioned. After all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted, he asked if everyone could excuse themselves for a moment. When they did, George took out a paper and pen and wrote a note, which read, To my friends, my work is done. Why wait? GE. He then took a pistol out from his nightstand and shot himself in the heart, ending his life at the age of 74. So who was this captain of industry, and why did he quite cheerfully suddenly choose to take his own life? George Eastman and his company turned photography from a complicated, expensive, unwieldy, and potentially dangerous hobby, due to the chemicals needed to develop the film, into one that quite literally a child could do. Like so many titans of industry, he was not only a genius inventor, but also a brilliant marketer. His story begins as it ended, in Rochester. The Eastmans always put a priority on education. In fact, George Eastman Sr. founded Eastman's Commercial College in 1854, the same year George Jr. was born. The family was middle class, living pretty comfortably, but this was short-lived. In 1862, when George was only eight, his father passed away from a brain disorder. His mother, Maria, was now a widow with three small children. One of them, George's youngest sister, Katie, suffered from polio and other illnesses. Life was hard for the Eastman family after George Sr.'s death, and self-reliance became a necessary trait. At the age of 14, George dropped out of high school to support his family. He worked at a local insurance company and as a clerk at Rochester Savings Bank. Then, in 1870, tragedy struck again when his sister, Katie, passed away from complications related to polio. She was buried next to her father. George, even at an early age, was meticulous, detailed, and controlling of every aspect of his own business. Starting when he got his first job at 14, he began keeping ledgers to detail his finances. Due to his careful planning and earning enough working at the bank, Eastman was able to afford certain luxuries. It was in one of these ledgers, under January 27, 1869 to be exact, that photography was first mentioned. As the months passed, besides helping to support his mother, George spent more and more money on photos or photograph materials. In 1878, Eastman learned an important lesson. Photography, at least at the time, was hard. Legend goes that he wanted to treat his mother to a vacation in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. Other sources say he was looking to buy land in the newly independent nation. Either way, to document his trip, he bought a photographic outfit. Cameras then are not what we think of them as today. An outfit included the camera, constructed from several parts that must be put together before taking pictures, a stand, a light, and wet glass plates with chemicals in order to preserve the picture. As Eastman later put it, in those days, one did not take a camera. One accompanied the outfit in which the camera was only a part. I bought an outfit and learned that it took not only a strong, but also a dauntless man to be an outdoor photographer. Eastman, so fed up with everything he had to bring, not only didn't take a camera, he didn't take the trip at all. At this point, Eastman thought to himself, there had to be a better way. For the next several years while working at the bank, Eastman developed a new kind of dry plate, one made out of gelatin. Yes, the same ingredient that would be used in Jell-O, which would be invented 20 years later in a small town 30 miles from Rochester. This gelatin was a replacement for the glass. Glass was heavy, fragile, and expensive. Gelatin was an improvement on all of these things. By 1880, he had patented a dry plate coating machine made out of gelatin, making the process of preserving film negatives simpler, cheaper, and less dangerous. 
While developing this process, he came across another innovation that would allow photography and eventually cameras to become something that wasn't just for the professional. As described by Eastman, I also made experiments by using paper as a temporary support and coating the cellulose immediately upon the paper and afterwards coating with the emulsion. I had no difficulty stripping the cellulose from the paper. The cellulose adhered to the emulsion and separated from the paper. He patented this film on March 4, 1884. That same year, Eastman and his associate, William Walker, developed a roll holder to hold the film. The invention of this revolutionary film wasn't enough, though. What he really wanted to do was to popularize photography to an extent as yet scarcely dreamed of. In 1888, the name Kodak was thought of while playing with an anagram set with his mother. Eastman loved the word because it was simple yet easy to pronounce, and it started with a K. Said Eastman, It became a question of trying out a great number of combinations of letters that made words starting with a K. Kodak was officially incorporated as a company in 1890 and quickly rocketed to the top of the industry. Also that same year, Eastman introduced the first Kodak camera, equipped with his film. It cost $25, which is about $640 today, but the most important thing was that the customer didn't do the developing of the film themselves. Kodak did. The customer would send the camera back, film and all, to the company for developing and processing. Their motto aptly illustrated this. You press the button, we do the rest. He had now made it easy for anyone to take and have pictures developed. The next step was to change the camera from a luxury or expensive hobby to something just about anyone could afford. In 1900, the revolutionary Brownie camera, versions of which were so popular through the mid-20th century, was born. It cost only $1, which is $28 today, and was even marketed to children. For the next 100 years, George Eastman and Kodak would be synonymous with cameras and film. For his entire 40-plus years of heading up his own company, George Eastman was used to being in control. So, when he was diagnosed with a spinal condition in the late 1920s, forcing him to be confined to a wheelchair, it depressed him greatly. His mother, who lived with him until her death in 1907, was also in a wheelchair for the last years of her life. His baby sister was in a wheelchair until she died. He saw them suffer, and Eastman did not want to go through the same long, drawn-out process. He also didn't like that he felt that this gave off an image of weakness. Eastman was used to being a man respected the world over, not, as he thought of it, an invalid. He mused greatly about death and illness, writing a friend, God help me from being like them, referring to family and friends who he had seen succumb to illness. Doesn't it seem strange that the clearest minds I have ever known should be taken this way? That is the sad thing about illness. So by March 1932, he had had enough. George Eastman wanted to go by his own hand rather than the hand of illness and fate. So he tidied up the loose ends of his life and, once completed, ended it immediately on his own terms. And now for a bonus fact. Contrary to popular belief, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the holiday season actually is the time of the year when there are the least amount of suicides, with the lowest point being December the 1st, and the lowest rate of the year by month being in December. The highest suicide rates actually occur during the springtime and then peak once again during fall. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, over there on the right are a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And thank you for watching.